appreciate it. And I'd especially like to thank the cross-border team for presenting. I have personally seen the cross-border offering and I truly believe that they've built a better solution for some common tax items. And what's even more amazing is that it has the added benefit of saving you some money versus the traditional providers. Um, so I'm very excited for you to see what they can do. As always, uh, I encourage you to let me know if there's other topics or other software solutions that you'd like to see covered in future webinars. And with that, I'm happy to throw it over to Cross Porter for us to get started. Thanks, Stu. Thank you for, for those words. We're super excited to be here, but also to be part of the Insight family. Uh, today, I'm, I'm Christy McDonald. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer of Cross Porter. I'm joined by our Chief Economist, Ms. Mimi Song, as well as our Director of R&D, Raheem Walji. Um, for those of you who don't know, Cross Border has really been in the tax space since the late 90s when we developed an in-house solution for transfer pricing compliance that was later sold to Thomson Reuters in 2007. With the introduction of the BEPS initiatives, uh, there was a huge market for us to come in and really do something game-changing for compliance. And for those of you who may not know, we are the largest independent tax technology firm uh, operating today in the world. We currently focus on transfer pricing and R&D tax credit. However, in 2021, we do have provision that will be up and coming. So we're very excited about that. All of those solutions are powered by what we call humane technology, which is a combination of AI and human experts uh, in the field to make sure that we're driving efficiencies and making sure that we have accuracy, but most importantly, to mitigate risk and to keep your costs down. Uh, we also have an ongoing educational arm as well uh, for all of the different products that, that we're involved in. So we have a transfer pricing university for both prospects and clients, as well as an R&D tax credit university. Um, all that's available on our website. So in the essence of time, we'll jump into the transfer pricing piece uh, and then we'll, we'll move over to R&D pretty quickly. So um, Fiona started with a single line of code. We were looking for a way that would help maximize the data collection and gathering when you're looking at your transfer pricing documentation. So understanding all of your entities and all of your transactions and making sure that as you're working on local file documentation, you're able to seamlessly draw in all of the country specific information around the laws, rules, and regulations. And, and Fiona allows us to do that in our technology, but it's also in a combination of the professionals that have both, both worked for the big four accounting firms in the industry side um, and within multinational companies. So it's really the only rational choice as you look at transfer pricing compliance today. Now, some of the reasons why we are better ascertained at this uh, product is that we're looking at things from a holistic perspective. Cross-border solutions doesn't take shortcuts in the execution of transfer pricing documentation. And that's really important in today's compliance environment because especially as we look at the COVID environment and the post-COVID environment, tax authorities are really struggling to close the gap in revenue that they've lost this year. And so making sure that you're not leaving any areas out and that you have the appropriate documentation everywhere you operate is really important. And so since the beginning, we've had about 5,000 multinationals utilize this platform. Um, I'll segue that to say that there are two unique ways that you can work with cross-border solutions. Most of our clients use us as a managed outsourcing partner where they deliver the data that we need to execute the documentation. Uh, and then about 10% of our clients actually utilize this tool internally to be able to execute documentation as well. Uh, the goal today will be to give you a sneak peek into that software so that you can understand how the team at Cross Border collects and executes documentation and is able to produce hyper-localized documentation uh, for both the, the local file and master file. So Fiona's approach is three-prong. Uh, we have a transfer pricing network on the Amazon Echo Dot 
Our solution is a cloud-based solution that is supported by uh, both AWS protocols as well as um, our own security measures. We recently passed our SOC 2 compliance. Um, so you can speak to Fiona yourselves. If you have an Echo Dot at home, you can simply ask Alexa to enable Fiona and you can ask hundreds of different transfer pricing questions that will give you real time data about the current and changing regulations. So if you're interested in what the economic analysis is in Australia, they'll tell you exactly what you need. Um, the second piece is the TP compliance which is making sure that from an individual company, country basis, excuse me, that everything is ticked and tied with what that country wants. So from the benchmark to the economic analysis, um, to the environment in which the documentation is being prepared for, if there's a local language requirement, and then all of the, the additional country nuances that must be embedded in that report as well. So, it's really about being as comprehensive as possible to make sure that from a tax authority perspective, nothing is being left out, right? We, we wanna give the precise story, but a story and a narrative and, and, and a set of data that is particularly catered to that country. And all too often, especially during our onboarding process, we still see a lot, a lot of regional work coming off of the big four. And, especially now with the change in compliance, you've really got to make sure that those types of shortcuts aren't happening because you can end up with a red flag in, in one of the tax authorities, which we all know becomes a domino effect. Once you've got an issue in one of your countries, they kind of crop up everywhere. Um, so from, from here, you basically have a team of professionals that are assigned to your account and to handhold you through things like uh, planning and restructuring and really making sure that we're able to optimize uh, your transfer pricing structure. And Mimi, I don't know if you wanted to add a little bit more to that as well. You mute. Once I figure out how to unmute, I can absolutely add to that. Essentially, we are a full stop uh, shop when it comes to transfer pricing, helping you really develop long-term sustainable business processes to manage this ever-increasing uh, transfer pricing requirement, right? Because we, we know the landscape has changed in post-BEPS environment. If anyone is unfamiliar with BEPS, it actually stands for Base Erosion Profit Shifting, which is very telling in terms of the mindset of tax authorities on a global basis, right? They, they're basically, you know, concerned that the tax structures, uh, because tax Station is a sovereign concept. We're, we're talking about an antiquated tax system that, first of all, doesn't even know how to deal with companies like ours that are much more innovative and have different business models than your traditional brick and mortar setup, right? So that's where we're coming from. And if we can get started, perhaps with the polling question, actually, Christina, because what we'd love to understand is what you guys are doing today, um, you know. Do you currently use an accounting firm to prepare transfer pricing reports? Uh, if you handle it in-house, you can select that. Or, and, and do you currently use one of the big four firms? So we'll just give it a mo uh, moment to, uh, to get everyone's assessment. Christina, should we move on? Okay. Great. So it does look like most of you guys are using an accounting firm and, and about a third are, are handling it in-house. Um, and the reason why ultimately, and, and then if you are using accounting firm, you, you're using the big four accounting firm, 90% of you guys are doing that. Um, and that's traditionally what we see, right? Like our, our big, biggest competitor in the space is actually the big four accounting firms. Uh, but I think transfer pricing is, is not rocket science, right? And so what we've done is we've developed Viona, we've developed this platform to ultimately help manage the current regulatory environment. We, we understand that not everybody's 
uh, uh, not everybody's primary scope of responsibilities is in the transfer pricing space. And so that's why we have these two approaches to the way that we work with you. We can either hold your hand every step of the way so that we're working with you um, similarly to how you're currently working with your accounting firm. And I like to think about that as a technology enabled service, right? Or you can use the software in house, right? I'm sure for those a third of you that are actually handling most of the documentation internally, um, I'm going to assume uh, that you're still outsourcing the benchmarks. And so even the benchmarks on a standalone basis can be pretty costly. So what we've done is develop this platform where ultimately we're managing the current regulatory environments and we're allowing, we're, we're allowing technology to provide the roadmap of what exactly is required on a country specific basis, right? We input all the different legal entities and one of the main things that anybody who's ever had to do a transfer pricing study understands is that you have to present your facts and circumstances in the best light possible. Transfer pricing is a little bit of an art, not a science. I'm sure people have heard that expression before because it's the way that you explain how, how your business is situated, where value is being created in order to justify the existing transfer pricing policy. Uh, and so it first starts with an understanding of the entire organization. What are the statement of facts? Who's doing what? But what has become really challenging is that each of the different jurisdictions might have about 80% of the documentation requirements that overlap, right? So the OECD established a framework that said, hey, we need to understand your business functions. That's great. But each of the different jurisdictions are now imposing their own localized requirements where they want to see some additional components of information. And what this is creating is a difficult environment for taxpayers to navigate. And so MNEs have had to rely on the big four accounting firms to be able to figure out, okay, well, if I'm doing a document, uh, if I'm doing my transfer pricing analysis and documentation for the Philippines, is it sufficient that I am just following the OECD guidelines? It is not, right? So I think that's the biggest challenge today. And, and that's what Fiona allows us to do. It, it provides the, the guidance or the roadmap to, to be able to meet those localized requirements on a country specific basis. And it does this dynamically because I wouldn't see all of these various tabs up here if my Canadian entity were not involved in the various intercompany transactions with these counterparties, all right? So that's one component of what it is that we're doing from a transfer pricing compliance perspective. And we also are able to organize all that information, you know, into, into the platform, into a cloud-based solution. So you'll be able to see the actual reports tied to an entity specific basis. And I'll show you that, I'll show you that through Compliance Central in one second. But really the piece de resistance, I think, when it comes to our transfer pricing software is the artificial intelligence that we've embedded here that overlays on top of the various comparable databases that we all use for transfer pricing purposes, right? Every type of analysis needs some form of benchmark. Now, what I'm gonna show you is a profit-based analysis where we have to do an external benchmark to look for third-party comparable companies, um, you know, performing services. Because I think for most of us out there, for most multinationals, you probably have some sort of services allocation, right? Like headquarter services. And, and that's, that's par for the course. There are many jurisdictions out, uh, excuse me, there are many companies out there that allocate headquarter charges. And, and you wanna be able to develop the narrative associated with um, what types of services are being performed, what benefits are the recipients receiving as a result of this allocation of costs and then assess whether or not there should be a markup on top of that from an economic or you know, from an arm's length uh, policy perspective. So this is the this is this is where we start that journey to figuring out exactly um, what service costs should be allocated. How do we describe what sort of benefit is being provided as a result of these particular types of services? We flush out the details of the functional analysis and, and, and we put in all of those details with, with the level of specificity that a tax authority wants to see. They wanna understand exactly 
what types of services are being providers, who's doing what, who's bearing what risks, what assets are being assumed, right? And, but then it, we take that one step further because if anybody, had, since many, many of you guys are using big four accounting firms traditionally to do your transfer pricing study, if you're using a profit-based analysis, one of the sections of that report is going to be the strategy applied to identify third-party comparables. Now, the, child, the problem has been that, and I've been in, I've been in this uh, situation many a times, I've been in transfer pricing for over 20 years, so I've done my fair share of comparable searching, and the problem has always been that, you know, it's a funnel approach, it's a principle-based approach, but you're limited by the, the detail of information that you're inserting into the funnel. And so a lot of that is related to using SIC codes. And, you know, if, if anyone's familiar with the SIC code structure, once again, that's a little bit of an antiquated stratification of the existing companies out in the world. And unfortunately, it was not created for transfer pricing purposes. So what we've been able to do using Fiona's artificial intelligence, using her ability to, um, uh, to learn and you know, process information through natural language processing and things of that nature, we've been able to create a classification system that's much more intuitive, right? And so the, the idea of the benchmarking in and of itself um, was something that a lot of taxpayers had relied on the, the accounting firms to do. But we made it much more intuitive to say, okay, what types of services are actually being performed or what type of activity is being performed for purposes of this analysis? And we've broken that down into classification codes instead uh, or major, minor, descriptive classifications instead of the traditional classifications. And what this allows us to do is explain to Fiona, okay, go out and find me these types of companies. This is what I'm looking for, for purposes of my transfer pricing study. Um, and you don't have to be a transfer pricing expert to be able to do that necessarily, right? But then she also takes into consideration the local rules and regulations in terms of what their requirements are to be able to find the best potential comparables there are for purposes of this analysis. She takes into account the fact of uh, the, the local regulatory environment of, okay, what are they looking for? In the US, for example, the US typically wants to see public comps, right? Why? Because public company data is audited. Uh, private company data is tenuous at times, depending on the jurisdiction. If, the com if that particular jurisdiction for which we're preparing a study requires local comps, Fiona will be mindful and only look at local comparables, right? And only put in, pull in companies with respect to that local jurisdiction. Um, if, if there are an insufficient number of comparables locally, depending on the preference requirements, Fiona's gonna account for, okay, in this jurisdiction, do I need to be more restrictive on market comparability or not? And so she's already gonna take those things into consideration. And what used to take a person like myself and a, a team of analysts more than I am uh, more than 40 hours to do this benchmarking. Fiona is able to do that within minutes, not even minutes, actually within seconds. Right. And she's going to come back with about 57 really good companies. And of those 57 really good companies now, the economist side of me wants to go and sort of tweak that and, and refine it. But in reality, Fiona has already done the heavy lifting in terms of assessing functional comparability, because that's the biggest challenge, right? It's much easier to apply quantitative statistics, uh, uh, quantitative uh, sort of eliminating or filtering factors uh, in the set of comparables, but it's much more difficult to have to go into each and every company to review their business description to determine if they're functionally comparable. And what Fiona's done is cast a much wider net uh, beyond human capabilities, brought back really good companies now we, that we can evaluate further. We can go to the website. We, we don't, we're not limited by database business descriptions anymore. And then we can further refine our analysis. So I do think that this is this is a very powerful component of what we're able to do. Um, and ultimately our focus is that this technology allows us to prepare what we refer to as 
hyper-localized studies, right? Because the best protection against a potential transfer pricing uh, adjustment is to make sure that you're meeting all of the localized requirements uh, as it pertains to the production of the transfer pricing studies for the, that particular jurisdiction. All right. Mimi, I'll just jump in before we transition over to R&D. When you look at, you know, the traditional accounting firms um, and the way those engagements are structured and you're looking at the amount of time it takes to do those benchmark searches, you know, this is where and how we're able to greatly reduce the cost of these engagements. Um, I'll also add at this moment that for Insight portfolio companies, we do have a partner agreement in place. Uh, in, in, insight companies receive a 30% reduction off of our standard pricing. Um, but more to that is the fact that cross-border solutions across all of our products also provides audit support. So, you know, if you find yourself running into situations where you're making compliance decisions based on your budget that's available, and therefore, you know, you may be leaving some countries out based on materiality or the perceived risk that you have, um, there is a way with cross-border solutions to obtain that comprehensive coverage and also stay within that budget and then not have to worry about the back end where perhaps the tax authority does have questions or you've received an IDR. Uh, the culture and the mission at cross-border solutions has always been that if we're gonna provide this work for you, then the accountability and the integrity of the work should be on us. And so to the extent that we need to remedy those questions um, and deal with anything from a local tax authority perspective to make sure that we're in alignment, cross-border does handle that. Uh, you know, as a caveat, we are not a law firm, so we do everything up through litigation. But again, that can greatly reduce the burden that you face uh, from a budget perspective when you are working with those big four accounting firms. All right, so I essentially I've been just showing a little bit of Compliance Central, um, but with that being said, Christy, perhaps we want to introduce uh, we want to introduce R and D. So let me just pull that up. So we recently, at the beginning of of this year, 2020, unveiled our R and D tax credit solution with the same, the same goals in mind. How do we reduce the budget that multinationals are spending on, on getting this form completed? And how can we more importantly maximize the amount of credits that you're able to obtain through this process? And that's where Fiona really scrapes things uh, to a very granular basis, looking to go beyond the way traditional providers would look at this, uh, making sure that there are no risks in, in the way this is being calculated and again, offering audit support. So on that note, I will hand it over to Raheem Walji, who is the, the director of this program, who's done a phenomenal job um, at getting our, our client base really secure and in, in handing this over to us. So Raheem, please. Excellent, thank you very much, everyone. Um, thank you, Christy, for the introduction as well. So uh, just to give some context of what I'm about to, to demonstrate for uh, the audience today. So the demonstration that we're working with is a client that has operations in multiple countries is seeking to calculate multiple incentives, whether that be country benefits or state benefits. Um, and this is particularly a, uh, a company that is developing and manufacturing products. Um, so you'll see different costs and things like that being captured. And I'll do my best to um, provide an educational layer for those of you that may not be as familiar with R&D um, and not just use all the typical lingo and make sure that, that there's at least some introduction of that information. So um, the first page that I'm going to show you here is Study Central. So ultimately, the purpose of our software is to provide the user um, or the client with real-time transparency and visibility into the analysis and what's taking place. So um, the biggest piece of feedback that we received when we were developing the product was not being able to understand what the status was of an analysis. So Study Central allows uh, an individual to see the jurisdictions that, being, that are being calculated, the entities that are being calculated, the status of the credit calculation, 
the uh, estimated or final credit amounts, the um, methodologies that are being utilized, as well as any deadlines that are applicable. So um, a, a client or a user can come in and see all of this information immediately and understand where the status of their projects are. Um, so here for this client, there's an Australia calculation being conducted, both a Canadian country credit and a provincial credit for Ontario, a US federal credit, and then three states, uh, Massachusetts, Virginia, and California. And that's relevant um, when, I, when I show later. So ultimately the way R&D works is a company has to be performing qualified activities and incurring qualified expenses in order to calculate an incentive. And so these figures here are actually coming from the, the, the expenses that a company is capturing. However, before you get there, you need to understand what projects are being qualified. And so our software also provides the qualification portion, not just the calculation, not just the quantification, it provides the qualification information as well. So a user or a client, or, or if it was outsourced, as Christy mentioned earlier, our team would come in and create projects within the software for your company. So if you were doing, for example, this client was developing mountain bikes and electric motors and internal software. So there's a, a variety of different projects that were being completed. Additionally, the software allows for easily dynamic functions to go between the different countries. So this would be the Australia project, here would be our Canada project, right? And all of the qualification requirements, as Mimi and Christy have mentioned with Fiona and the artificial intelligence that exists within the platform, Fiona knows all the rules and regulations. So if I go into the, the actual project and I go here to qualify the project, the requirements for the jurisdiction automatically populate. So Canada actually requires a scientific or technological uncertainty, hypotheses formulation, systematic investigation or search, technical advancement, and then documentation, right? So all of these uh, qualification queries are presented so that they could be addressed from a compliant standpoint, both from a simple yes, no, to ensure whether it's being qualified, and then additional context and details, which are relevant to the reporting requirement from many jurisdictions that exist. And these are all very dynamic. So if I go into the US and I go into qualify a project, you will see that the requirements change. The US requires a permitted purpose, technical uncertainty, process of experimentation, and technological in nature. So again, Fiona has all the information in the background. And in that combination of that humane technology that, that Christy and Mimi mentioned, Fiona has the technology and the knowledge. And then our team, from an advisory standpoint and audit support standpoint, is always available to assist in answering questions helping navigate the software and provide context and also serve as sort of a quality assurance um, within the process. So again, this is the project portion. Again, similar to Study Central, uh, a viewer or a user could come in and see the status of each of their projects and the costs being captured so that a company can really determine where are the significant amount of expenses being incurred and understand where that's coming from. Um, just in terms of functionality, I'll, I'll quickly touch on this. One of the components within R&D incentives generally is allocating portions of qualified time. So very high level, some companies already utilize some sort of project or time or labor tracking system internally. However, there are a lot of smaller businesses that don't. And so we um, have created this functionality within the platform to aid and assist companies that maybe do not have this functionality, but would like to use it when it comes to their R&D activities. Um, so a company could come in, could identify which project that was being worked on, the start date and end date, and actually input the time that was spent on R&D activities. But I won't spend too much time there because a lot of companies either have something internally already or utilize a survey method. So it's, it's a feature that's available, um, and we thought it would be helpful for those that really didn't want it. But the next piece to focus on is really the expenses, because this is where all of the, the, the calculation, the financials, this is where all of that information comes into play. Um, one of the great things about the, the software platform is it allows for versatility. So if a company already has reporting systems that they utilize and, and um, documents that they can generate from their system, our team can gather those expenses, normalize the data, and upload that into the, the platform, and Fiona can ingest it and use the information. We're also able to provide templates to clients 
who simply want to fill out the information themselves and provide it back and simply upload it into the system. Similar to the qualification component, the quantification component is also dynamic by jurisdiction. What I mean by that is currently we're looking at the US. The US has categories for costs and what can be captured are located up here at the top. So US allows for labor costs, which we have here, material costs or supplies as we call them, which would be relevant, especially in product development, outside consultant costs. So uh, if you hire any 1099s or contractors or consultants to participate or support or drive the development or research and development activities, those costs can be captured. And then of course, if a company is developing uh, software and they're leveraging cloud uh, uh, hosting for the development and testing environments, those costs can be captured as well. But the dynamism comes in where I go to Australia. You can automatically see the categories at the top change because Fiona already knows what that jurisdiction requires and allows you to capture so that a client who wanted to capture Australian expenses knows exactly how they can do that. Similar with Canada. One of the great features of, of what we do is um, the artificial intelligence piece, right? So uh, in addition to having all of this information in here, you can see the individuals that are participating, their uh, labor costs, how much is allocated, and ultimately what the qualified expenditures are for those individuals or for the materials or for the um, consultants. But one of the great things is um, Fiona actually performs analyses of the data that, that resides within her system to provide insights is what we call them. So if I were to go up here and I were to click on this Fiona Insights button, what's gonna happen is Fiona is going to actually run an analysis of the data. And so what she's gonna do is help identify areas of opportunity or areas of potential risk. So for example, one of the first things that she's done with this data set is identified employees out of range. What that means is in Fiona's historical experience or looking simply at the data set in front of her, Fiona is saying that I'm seeing some discrepancies in the way that the data is being captured or the allocation is being provided. What that means is in, in R&D, an employee, or if you're trying to capture labor costs, you have to allocate the amount of or percentage of time that's being spent on qualified activities versus non-qualified activities. So in these examples here that Fiona is identifying, the purple are where Fiona would expect the allocations to be based on either her experience in the industry or with the data set in front of her. And so what she's doing here is saying in, for a developer, she normally sees the job title itself get allocated in the 80 to 100% range given the scope of activities that a developer would perform. However, in this instance, we have a couple of developers that are lower than that. So what the, the intelligence in the system is doing is pointing out areas of opportunity or areas to sort of double check and say, are we missing any potential costs that are being left on the table? Or let's just double check that we have Julian and, and Sherry's uh, allocations correctly. The same thing here for product development. On the flip side, Fiona's also helping to identify areas of potential risk or areas of potential exposure. And what that means is here, for example, with QC Techs, Fiona is saying that we can see that normally it's five to 10%, Miles is at 35. She's just asking to double check. Fiona also helps on the flip side to identify potential other areas of opportunity. So if you notice the, these three states were not included, however, there were costs allocated in the background data. Fiona does a quick math and says, there's a potential Florida, Texas, and South Carolina opportunity. So hopefully you can see how the software is working to, to assist in the process. And then at the end of the day, Everything that gets input here from a qualitative standpoint, from a uh, uh, quantitative standpoint, all gets compiled into a report that is available um, within the software and it's all automatically generated. So I'll just quickly pull that up and then I am done for the day. So you'll see all the quantification, the, the project summaries, all that information is here. And, and for Anyone that would like to see a copy of a sample R&D tax credit report or a transfer pricing report, um, anyone on today's call or who has listened to this webinar is welcome to receive that. Um, there is a particular uh, website for Insight Portfolio Companies. It's xbs.ai backslash insight. Um, from a transfer pricing perspective, we'd love to put together what we call a work compliance plan 
that pulls together the laws, rules, and regulations for the countries that you currently operate within. It's a really nicely put together educational piece so that you have it, so that if you are looking at the work that's currently being done for you, you can cross check if it's meeting all of those buckets. Um, and there's an additional exercise that we'd welcome anyone to join into, which is called the GAP analysis, where we'll take a look at one of your previously executed transfer pricing studies through the eyes of the tax authority. Our economists will review it and highlight any gaps in coverage, any imminent risks that we see, uh, and discuss our approach and how we would help to, to mitigate that risk. Uh, Mimi, if you'd like to add to that as well. Well, I actually saw that there was a question from the audience um, sure. for, for Rahim, R&D tax credits. Uh, someone was ask, asking, are you also covering R&D qualification requirements for Switzerland? So yes, great question. So our uh, software platform is capable of calculating um, R&D incentives for 70 plus jurisdictions and Switzerland is one of those in terms of any deductions and credits. Now, patent boxes and accelerated depreciation and things like that are more on the accounting side of how you do that. So that's not necessarily what, what we focus on. We can always provide assistance, but in terms of credits and deductions and, and super deductions and things like that, yes, our software is capable of performing those analyses. Are there any other questions that anyone has? We'd like to open up a few minutes to address questions and answer them. Of course, if you think of questions after today's conversation, we're happy to answer those. I think for us, the takeaway is very much that, you know, a tax technology application can very easily get you to a place of comprehensive coverage while reducing your fees. One of the great components of an engagement with cross border is we've instituted a, a 30 day period where in the first 30 days of our relationship, we'll execute a report for you so that you can not only work through the relationship with the team that's dedicated to working on your account, but more importantly, see what the output looks like so that you can be fully comfortable in making a switch um, from your current provider. We, we have about 500 conversations a month with prospects about transfer pricing and R&D tax credit most of which work with the big four. And we certainly can understand that anytime a change is made, um, you know, a lot of people and, and decision making get involved in that. So we wanna make sure that your team is comfortable and that you understand that we realize that there are other projects uh, ongoing and initiatives and, and there's always a concern of having your team put in additional time and resource in, into transitioning. Um, and we've done this over and over again, and it's become a very seamless process to keep your transfer pricing going without reinventing the wheel, if you will, right? Picking up the pieces from where your last provider um, left off. So we would like to thank everyone for joining today. And certainly we, we look forward to being able to continue the dialogue with uh, each of you that's joined today. Mimi? I echo Christy's sentiments. I think when we talk about tax technology, um, it, it's 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 come a long way, right? Uh, and in fact, you know, we are the pioneers when it comes to tax technology, especially transfer pricing technology. Uh, it's from the late '90s with Joan Shear as the we call her the original, <laughs> the OG. Um, is phenomenal, I think, and and really. You know, it doesn't have to be as complicated, right? It doesn't have to be rocket science. And what we are here to accomplish is specialization, maximization, risk reduction. Like this is this is our focus, uh, and and we hope to bring that level of value back to your organization as well. All right. Christina. So thank you both of you for an amazing presentation. As I mentioned earlier, we will be sharing a recording of this session via email later today. So keep a lookout for that. But thank you everyone for your time. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank everyone. you all.